Good morning, everyone. You're very welcome to our worship service. And on your behalf, I give a very special welcome to Mr. Derek French, who serves the Lord in northern Spain through the Presbyterian Church in Ireland. Derek, it's always a joy to have you with us. Uh, We look forward to what you have to tell us about uh, your work and the message you'll bring to us from God's Word. And we pray you'll know God's blessing and presence as you worship with us today. Few announcements to begin with. First of all, there's tea, coffee, juice, and biscuits for everyone in the main hall after this service. And then our third membership class is this afternoon at 4 p.m. in the committee room. There'll be a meeting in the committee room on Tuesday at 8 p.m. for anyone who would be willing to help with a Christmas tree festival in December. Uh, This is a great opportunity for us to share the gospel with the people of this community. So please come along, get involved in the planning from the very start. We're going to need people for all sorts of jobs. There will be something for everyone. So please uh, come along on Tuesday night and be part of it. Then our midweek meeting is on Wednesday at 8 p.m. in the committee room, and we'll study chapter 28 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is about baptism. No matter what age you are or what stage you're at in your Christian life, you will benefit from coming to learn more about God because it will enable you to delight in God more and to serve him better. And baptism is one of those things that there's often confusion around. The Westminster Confession of Faith is very clear uh, about baptism, so come along uh, and be informed about that. God calls us to worship with these words from Mark chapter 8. Jesus said, whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. If we're trusting Jesus to be our Savior and we're living with him as the Lord of our life, then we shouldn't be ashamed to admit that to anyone. Later in our service, we'll see, the, the, we'll see that the Apostle Paul said something very similar uh, to Timothy. Our opening hymn uh, is giving God the glory for who he is and what he has done. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his sons. Let us join together uh, to praise God.
us come before God with our prayer of adoration, confession, and thanksgiving. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we have gathered here today to worship you and give you the glory because you are the only true and living God. We begin to realize just how wonderful you are when we consider the many aspects of your perfect character which you've revealed to us in your word, the Bible. We want to praise you for being gracious. Your common grace provides all of us with everything we need to live, air to breathe, food to eat, water to drink, clothes to wear, a home to live in, and a family to love us. Your saving grace provides the means by which our sins are forgiven. Thank you for perfectly and completely working out your plan of salvation through your own dear son, Jesus, who yielded his life and his atonement for sin, and thereby opened the life gate so that all who believe in him may go in. We recognize that your common grace and your saving grace are given to us because you are rich in love and not because we deserve them. If we in any way deserve these gifts, they would no longer be grace. We also want to praise you for being compassionate. Often we are troubled by things or sad about situations. Thank you that we can be sure you love us and you know, understand, and care about what we're going through. We recognize that you've proven this to be true in many ways and on many occasions in our lives. What a comfort it is to know that you live within your people, in the person of the Holy Spirit, because this means you're always with us, whatever we're experiencing. Almighty God, we praise you for being faithful to all the promises you've given to us in the Bible. Often we forget about the promises we have made to you and to other people. Often our weakness means that we are unable to keep the promises we have made to you and to other people. We're grateful that you do not suffer from either of these problems. So we can rely on you to remember your promises and to be able to keep them. God of mercy, thank you for being slow to anger because we have rebelled against your perfect commands many times. The Apostle John reminds us that if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Today, we particularly seek your forgiveness for being ashamed to testify about our Lord because we did not want to suffer in any way for the gospel. Forgive us for doing what you say is evil and failing to do what you say is good. We praise you for assuring us that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Enable us to always be humble enough to confess our sins to you and to trust in Jesus' redeeming work so that we receive the pardon and cleansing you promise us. Help us to rely on your power to live for you and to resist the temptations we face every day. Sovereign Lord, thank you for teaching us great things and for doing great things through Jesus. But we realize our wonder and joy will be purer, higher, and greater when we see Jesus. So we long for the day when he will return to make all things new. As we worship you in the meantime, enable us to respond to your invitation to find joy in you. We recognize that we can only come to you through the merits of your Son. So it's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. We affirm what we believe by thinking about a question from the Westminster Shorter Catechism. The 14th question asks, what is sin? And the answer we're given is, sin is disobeying or not conforming to God's law in any way. In other words, sin is any failure to do what God wants us to do. This includes doing things that God says we shouldn't do and not doing things that God says we should do. It also includes our thoughts and our desires and our words. 
failing to glorify and enjoy God in any of these areas is what Scripture defines as sin. I'll read the question, and please join me in answering it. What is sin? Sin is disobeying or not conforming to God's law in any way. Boys and girls, we like to join me at the front. I'll come to speak to you. Great. Last week, we learned that God raised up a leader to deliver his people from being slaves in Egypt. Does anyone remember the name of that leader? We had a little basket, and we had a little baby in it. And what was the little baby called? Yeah. Moses. Moses, yeah. And imagine being a slave your whole life. None of us have ever been slaves. But imagine being a slave your whole life. Every day you wake up, you get out of bed, you have a quick breakfast, and you spend the rest of your day doing whatever your taskmaster tells you to do. And the Israelites were slaves in Egypt for over 400 years. As they built the pyramids for the Egyptians, some of them may have hoped that a new pharaoh who would get rid of slavery would come to power. Others may have thought about how they could escape from Egypt. One thing we know for sure that some of them did, they remembered about God, and they prayed that God would deliver them. And we learned that last week, God saw their suffering, He heard their prayers, and He put His plan to save them into action. We saw that at the burning bush, our always and forever God called Himself by a strange name, He says, I am who I am. And then he told Moses, I am the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I have surely seen the affliction of my people here in Egypt and have heard their cry. I know their sufferings, and I have come to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a land flowing with milk and honey. That's the promise God gave Moses at the burning bush. God always keeps his promises. And today we're going to watch the exciting story of that promise rescued. Chapter 14, free at last. Exodus 4 to 15. If you and your family a really, really big family, were slaves for 400 years. How would you expect to get free? Maybe a law could be passed outlawing slavery, or maybe a new president could be elected. Or maybe you could dig a super long tunnel and disappear to a new country. With over four centuries to think and pray about it, I bet the Israelites had dreamed of a thousand different ways to freedom. And yet, they probably never imagined what God had planned for their deliverance. They had no idea that Moses, that man who had run away from Egypt 40 years earlier, would be God's chosen man to confront Pharaoh. They had no idea that they would have to make bricks without straw. They had no idea that God would give Moses powerful signs to impress Pharaoh and that Pharaoh wouldn't be at all impressed. They had no idea that everything was going to get worse before anything started to get better. But that's how God usually works. Trouble before triumph, suffering before salvation, danger before deliverance. And in this case, a nasty plight before a lot of plagues. Ten plagues to be exact, each of them meant to make the gods and goddesses of Egypt look small and the real god of Israel look big. First came blood, then frogs and gnats and flies, then dead animals, then boils and hail and locusts, then darkness, and finally, death of the firstborn. 
it was a hard time for the Egyptians and a hard heart for Pharaoh. No matter how many times Moses talked to Pharaoh and no matter how bad the next plague was, Pharaoh just wouldn't let the Israelites go. That was Pharaoh's fault and God's plan all at the same time. When Pharaoh finally let the people go, he changed his mind one last time and chased the Israelites to the Red Sea. It looked like things were about to get a lot worse, but they didn't. The bad things, that is, they got much better. Just when the Egyptians had the Israelites stuck between a rock and a wet place, God blew the water into two walls and God's people walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. True, the Egyptians followed after the Israelites to destroy them, but that was hardly a fair fight. After all, the Lord fights for his people. God made the Egyptians panic, made their chariots heavy, and then made the water swallow them up. The Israelites were so happy, they sang and danced and praised God for their redemption. God had answered their prayers, and the people were free at last. So God saved his people from the Egyptians. And there's a pattern in how God works. You heard it mentioned there. There's trouble before triumph. There's suffering before salvation. There's danger before deliverance. And the story of our rescue from slavery to sin by Jesus is exactly the same. Jesus was rejected by his people. He was arrested, sentenced to death, mocked, spit on, slapped, and finally crucified on a cross. Jesus experienced tr trouble, suffering, danger, and death. But thankfully, the story didn't end there. After the trouble, suffering, danger, and death came the triumph, salvation, deliverance, and life. Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus triumphed over the grave. Jesus saves everyone who trusts in what he did to rescue them from slavery to sin. And Jesus will return one day uh, to finally and completely deliver us from trouble, suffering, danger, and death. The Israelites were saved from the angel of death who passed over Egypt as the 10th plague by putting the blood of a what on their door. What did they put on their door? Do you remember? The blood of a what did they put around their door? I don't remember. A spotless one-year-old male lamb. And God told the Israelites to do that, to give us a clue about how he would save his people through Jesus. Because of the blood of his perfect lamb, God is able to pass over our sin. Everyone who believes that Jesus died on the cross as our sinless Passover lamb, to pay the price for our sins will be saved. That means that God will pass over us on judgment day if we believe that Jesus is our perfect sacrifice. And that means we'll be free at last and forever. Thank you so much. We're going to say your prayer together. If you want to go back to your seats, we'll say it all together, adults and all and then we'll sing your hymn. So let's all say our prayer together. O oh, great God, we praise you for setting us free and giving us a new start in Jesus. Amen. Listen, would you maybe play through the first part of this hymn because maybe a wee bit new to us.
Please take your Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to read verses 8 to 18. You'll find this on page 1195 if you're following in the Pew Bibles. As you know, this is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to uh, Timothy, who was a younger uh, man, uh, giving him instructions really uh, about how to live the Christian life and to serve God. So, 2 Timothy chapter 1, beginning to read at verse 8 on page 1195. And this is God's word we're reading, so we can trust it completely. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, or ashamed of me, his prisoner. But join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has, it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. This is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed, because I know whom I have believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. What you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord show mercy to the household of Anesiphorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. Amen. We thank God for his word, and we pray that he will bless it to our understanding. <coughs> Boys and girls, if you like to leave for Sunday school, now is the time to do so, and Derek will come and bring his message to us. Well, thank you again for the invitation to come and speak. Although I was the one that asked Nigel, do you want me to speak? <laughs> so uh, it's an invitation, but with a prompting, yes? It's great to be back here again and great to be able to uh, speak about God's word and speak about uh, the work in Spain. Uh, before we begin, let's come to God in prayer. Father, we pray that you would help us to set aside all concerns that we have this morning, all worries, all fears, all disappointments. We're not saying that we just want to say, let's forget about them. We're saying we're committing them into your loving arms, knowing that you are the God of all compassion, knowing that you are the all-knowing, all-powerful God. 
who goes beyond our understanding and our imaginations. Knowing that you are able to change people's hearts and minds and transform any given situation. So as we do that, we also ask you, give us a vision for the lost, a vision for those who need you, not just here, but also in the Basque Country and in Spain, as well as other parts of the world. We ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> I'm conscious that I have not too much time and that I have to do a report and also uh, speak from God's Word. And we'll try to do the best and we'll try to finish on time, okay? Uh, just, I have a bit of a problem this morning. Not only am I deaf in one ear, but I'm half blind as well. Um, I got new glasses in Spain and the prescription is totally wrong. I'm driving the car, and I don't know whether it's better to put on the glasses or off. It's that bad. Uh, I hope there's no police here this morning. <laughs> um, I want to share with you uh, the work in, in the Basque Country and where we're at and what we've been doing over the last year or so. Um, two weekends ago, I was in Madrid, in the south of Madrid. It took five and a half hours to go. Uh, the first four and a half hours in the car are all motorway. The rest of it, about an hour, less than an hour, is up these dirt tracks into the middle of absolutely nowhere. Um, you wonder, is it a road at all? Um, Luca, my son, who's 14 now, uh, he begged me that he should go. I said, Luca, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, but he wanted to go. So he came with me and he became the center of uh, the camp. Everyone was wanting to talk with him because he was the youngest and Luke is not shy. When he wants to talk, he talks. When we arrived there, um, basically it was a real, real encouragement. Uh, there was over a hundred students from all over Spain gathered together. And the purpose was there, it was very simple, to learn more about God through his word and also to find out how best to share God's, uh, the good news about Jesus uh, in their given situation. We heard a story um, from a group in Valencia. We used to live in Valencia uh, in the south of Spain, southeast Spain, for about four years. So, when I heard the, the report, or the, the beginning of the report, I, I was really, really interested, as you can imagine. They had an a evangelistic event where uh, they invited their fellow students to come along. One night, there was 40 non-Christian students who came along. Isn't that great? You know, there were these Christian students, unashamed, inviting their friends to come along to this event. Praise God for that. You see, the questions that were being asked are very relevant to, not just to the Christian students, not just to the non-Christian students, but to all of us. Questions like, what is the purpose of my life? What is my identity? Who am I exactly? Why do I have such negative thoughts, etc.? And they were addressing all these questions. Undoubtedly, we've asked those questions ourselves. What's my purpose in life? What am I here for? The Bible is very clear. We're here to glorify God by enjoying him forever. And that's so important, isn't it? That we are here to glorify him, 
we worship together, but not only do we worship together, but we worship out there as well. But also, we have to make sure that we understand the second part, by enjoying him forever. Enjoying who God is. Enjoying that we know him as our Savior and God. Enjoying him that we know no matter what happens to us, we are safe. A friend of mine once said these words, life is very brief. And he talks about the brevity of life. But also he talks about the brevity of death for the Christian. Going through one door and going into eternal life. It's amazing, isn't it? We should be rejoicing, shouldn't we? Sharing the good news like these students to those who we meet, etc. The Bible says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Men, do you believe that? And you will receive a special blessing from God. I have to say that because uh, the next part of the talk is, yes, I'm involved in it, but I'm involved in the background. My wife, Jane, is involved in this and damn your kids. Uh, a few years ago, I think all the Sunday schools in the Presbyterian Church in Ireland raised money for this project. Something like 50,000 was raised and it went towards this pro pro uh, project. It's basically looking to have provide material for parents, for young children, and also for, uh, for teenagers. What we have to do is quite a, a task. I'll give you an example that is my wife is presently working on uh, with three elders. Basically, that is trying to find right material in Spanish, devotional material that uh, young uh, teenager, teenagers can use. We have, and this is the first time, and it's, it's absolutely brilliant, we have a Spanish person writing the actual material. Normally, what we do is translate them from English into Spanish. But a few years ago, I challenged the Spanish, uh, saying, look, we're doing too much translating. It's about time you grew up. I did say it that way too. But this girl has been writing, uh, she's written uh, so far 77 studies, devotional material. And she writes it, another Spanish girl uh, corrects it, and then it's sent to Jane and she corrects it again, okay? And then it's handed on, on to me and I just say, correct. I trust you, that's my part. But look at the, the topic here, I'm trying to see uh, uh, what happens when you fail. Things like that, just small little stories, helping children, etc. This is for young, uh, younger children, helping to understand themselves and also helping uh, the parents to actually deal with these feelings, emotions, thoughts, etc., so that they have uh, good resources there to help them. We here in Northern Ireland, we can walk into the Faith Mission Bookshop, grab the book and go home and use it, simple as that. Let's move on. Uh, this is just uh, more um, books by Sally Lloyd-Jones. I don't know if any of you know of Sally Lloyd-Jones. Yes, good. Um, we're getting a lot of her books into Spanish as well. I'm moving on quickly. In Galicia, Galicia that is in the north of Spain, a friend of mine went to the educational board there and said, we have these books. Uh, about the Bible, etc., can we actually donate them and that you use them in the schools? Surprisingly, they came back and said, yes. Isn't that a lovely way to see the gospel advancing, even through that? We have the radical book, El Libro Radical, 
Uh, that's been translated not just into Spanish, but also into the Basque language. The Basque language is very like, what shall I say, like the Irish language. It's totally 100% different. You look at it and you won't understand it. You have to learn it. But there are what we call pueblos, small towns where the people mostly speak uh, Basque and they're very proud of it. So we want to provide these, these resources in the Basque to encourage them to read it as well. All this is an expensive project, but very worth it. Pray that God will speak through this. Um, also, in the, uh, we have translated uh, these booklets, uh, Why Jesus, uh, Why Christmas, Why the Cross, Why the Resurrection, Why Read the Bible, uh, uh, Why Jesus Must Return. We got these all translated into Spanish first, and then we actually got them translated into the Basque language. Let me go back there. One of the persons that actually did the translation into the Basque language is called Verona. She's called Veronica. A lovely, lovely, lovely girl. She became a Christian when she was in England, and then she moved back to her home again. Her level of Basque is extremely high, but she's a bit of a perfectionist. And she's back at kind of studying again, and in a class where they're mostly experts and then there is her professor. Veronica did most of the translating in the Basque, and how she did it was very simple. She went to her professor and said, can you help me translate this? You know what she was doing, don't you? She was using it to share the gospel with her professor. At Christmas, in her class, um, she got the, the uh, booklet, Why Christmas, in Basque, and gave one to each person that was there. And then for the rest of the, the time, the hour or so, they talked about it. Absolutely brilliant, isn't it? Using her imagination, using her gift for the glory of God. We have always been looking to develop team ministry again, uh, especially after COVID. COVID, there was a massive interruption, and the team that we had before COVID, well, they went back home, etc., etc. And we've been praying, asking God, please raise up a team again. And God has been answering our prayer. In the top left hand corner, you'll see Jamie. Jamie and myself have worked together, he's from America. We've worked together for about eight years. He's been working for another mission, and, but we would meet up to pray, we would meet up to talk, etc. His time with that mission came to an end, and uh, basically we talked about actually working together full time. This time last year, he wasn't even married. Thir 38 years of age. Now his wife is pregnant. That's fast, isn't it? He came to me and he says, Derek, I've met this girl, Annika from Germany, and she's about 30, 36. And he said, I'm thinking of asking her out. Then he came back to me once she said yes, and he said, oh, we're thinking of getting married. Maybe leave it for a while, but we are. I said, no, do it sooner rather than later. And I just said, because do you want to have children? And uh, he said, yes, of course. Well, go and do it. So that's why it was the big rush. I'm to fall. I'm to blame. Um, they're coming and joining us probably in October. Jamie is an absolute fantastic evangelist. He's a bridge builder and an evangelist. No matter what group of people you put him with, whether it's children, teenagers, uh, young adults, older people, within two minutes, he'll know what your interests are. He's a great uh, communicator. Do pray for him, because we can learn so much for his zeal, and as well for Annika as well. 
Below uh, Jamie and Annika is Anna. She's been working in Spain for the last uh, 40 years. She's the pastor, uh, she's the wife of the Spanish pastor, but she's been on, on working with us as well. Pray for her. Uh, pray for the girl, uh, um, Sarah, from Germany. You'll be hearing a little bit about her in a minute. Um, she comes from East Germany, brought up in an atheist home. Up until she, she was 21, she did not even believe that God exists. She just said, no, nope, he doesn't. But she went to university, and there was this crazy guy there. Crazy? Well, maybe crazy in the eyes of the world. Because he kept talking about Jesus. And he kept talking about how Jesus uh, uh, died on the cross for him. And how he, he got to know Jesus. And he talked about the Bible. At first, it annoyed her. But then she began to investigate Soon, she became a Christian. Later on, I will let her tell you the rest of that story. Uh, there's also a girl, Anna, um, beside Jane and myself. Uh, she's a, a linguistic student coming for four months next year from Durham University. It's great to have these students come along. Her purpose, rather what she said to me, was, look, I want to come and improve my Spanish, yes, but my priority is to share the gospel. Pray for her. I'm going to show you this video, or, or rather it should be, I should say, uh, let's see, Nigel, I might need, oh no, I think I'm right. And, oh, no. Nigel, I think I'll let you do it, yeah. Um, this is my wife, to give you the context, this is my wife, um, interviewing Sarah. Now, Jane is in Bilbao and Sarah is in Germany. So there's, the setting is slightly different, just in case you're confused. Okay. Answer to prayer. Many of you have been praying along with us for a number of years for others to join us here in the Basque country so that we can have a team working together to extend God's kingdom. Over the past year, we are seeing this begin to come to fruition. Currently, we have several people interested or in the process of coming to join us. And today, we want to introduce you to Sarah from Germany, who is planning to join us this summer. Hi, Sarah. Tell us a little bit of where you're from uh, where you grew up and how briefly how you came to know Jesus. Hi, my name is Sarah and I'm grow I grew up in the east of Germany in the part who was ruled by the Russian for over 50 years. And I grew up as an atheist. I grew up in an atheist uh, family and I got to know Christ when I was uh, during my studies, I studied social work and there was one of my colleagues, he was um, always, always talking about Jesus and the Bible. And I got really curious because he was like really crazy, but at the other time, at the, at the same time, he was really, really loving the people around him. So when I turned 24, uh, he induced me to Jesus. And when I turned 25, I got baptized, baptized. You spent a year in the Philippines. Can you share with us why you went there and what you did while you were there? I had the opportunity to go to the Philippines and I went there for one year. I worked there in an orphanage and in a really, really small private hospital for kids who couldn't afford the um, medication or stuff like this so they had a place to come and stay and get healthy or die in dignity or with dignity and I went there because people came to me and be like we're like 
oh, Sarah, you would be a, such a great missionary or the wife of a missionary. And I was like, okay, God, let's see if this is true. So I said, here's one year of my life. You can take it. You can do whatever you want. And he sent me to the Philippines. That, that's why I went there. And it was a really, really special time. It was um, really challenging, but really great also. And this was the beginning for me for uh, the mission abroad. You went to Bible college in Germany for three years. What did you find helpful during your time there? And what did you find challenging or difficult? The best part about Bible college was the fact that I was able to study the Bible and that I got so many answers for my questions and a lot of a lot of friendships i really enjoyed living with these people but the hard part was also living with a lot of people uh, you're never alone and this could be challenging sometimes you believe god has called you to the basque country and to work with us here in teen ministry what are your aspirations and hopes my hopes for the time in the past country will be that I can be a blessing. Like I can be a blessing for the Basque people, for the Basque country, for the team. Um, I really hope that God allows me to see his miracles in the life of people, to see how he changes the life of people. Um, I would love to read the Bible with seeking persons and persons who are yeah, looking for answers because God will give them and I really, really like to see when he when he's doing this. Okay, I see the time is slipping away. I'll leave it there with regards to the rest of the PowerPoint. But I want you to turn to, uh, very, very quickly with me uh, to 2 Timothy again. And just to share a few thoughts on this from God's Word. The, the title is Do Not Be Ashamed. Do not be ashamed of the Gospel. Do not be ashamed of, of your brothers and sisters who are sharing the Gospel. As was said, Paul was writing here. He was writing from prison, and he was writing to his beloved uh, son in, in God, uh, that is Timothy. And he was trying to encourage him. And it's what I want to do today, is try to encourage us as well. It's what I want to do with these guys on the team, is to encourage them. Don't don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. And one of the ways that helps us not to be ashamed of the gospel is to think of, first of all, who God is. That he is the creator God, the God who created everything. Absolutely fantastic. Could you imagine that? That's our God. And he's not just the creator God, he's the sustainer God. He sustains everything. He keeps you and me alive until the appointed time. Our lives are 100% safe in his hands. And so we should be rejoicing. As I used to say to, as I say sometimes when I'm doing evangelistic training, our God is too small. We've got to absolutely open up our vision of how, who God is and what he is like, to be proud of him, to be proud to be called his child. But here Paul goes in from another angle when he talks about do not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, the context is extremely important here because Paul was in prison. He was writing a letter to Timothy and one of his main desires was to see Timothy again before Paul passed away. 
He wanted to see Timothy. Now, where was Paul? He was in prison in Rome. Paul was going to be executed. Why? Because he was preaching the gospel. Now, could you imagine if you were Timothy and you get this letter and you're being encouraged to come to Rome, to walk to Rome? What would be going through your head? Well, I know what would be going through my head is common sense. That is, if Paul is going to be put in prison, if Paul's in prison because of the gospel, and I go with him, and I associate with him, there's a big chance that I too will be in, put in prison and suffer as well, and possibly be executed. So as he walked those roads on the way to Jerusalem, there probably was fear. And I totally understand that. I don't think it's just that Timothy was a timid type of person. I actually think he was a brave person. A brave person, because he did that. But Paul very quickly says these words in 2 Timothy 1, verse 5. He tries to encourage him. And he says, I am reminded of your sincere faith. So he points inwards and tell Paul, uh, he tells Timothy, look at the sincere faith that you have. It's real. And that's why we do need to stop and think at times about our own faith. Is it real? Is it sincere? And what is it based on? Paul could see in Timothy his faith was real. But it didn't stop there. And we see three generations being brought forward. Number one, Timothy. Number two, his grand grandmother. Number three, his mother. What a family. Absolutely brilliant, isn't it? He reminds them. Now, there might be some grannies here this morning. What are you passing on to the next generation? Sincere faith to your grandchildren that they can look in your life and say, wow. You mothers, what are you passing on to your children? Sincere faith, etc. He was reminding of the, what they had prioritized in their life. And then he says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift that God has given you. Each one of us here have been given gifts by God. We can allow those gifts to die, or we can do what Paul is saying, fan into flame. And I believe it's just simply as this, put it into action. Whatever God has given you, use it for his glory. And that's what he wants to do. Fan it into flame. Now finally, because of time, he reminds Timothy, imagine again he's walking on that road to, to Rome. And he says in verse 7, for God, has, uh, gave us a, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. He hasn't. He has given us the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. He has given us this spirit in each one of If we say we are believers, if we say we are followers of, of Jesus, if we say we're Christians, guess what? God, by his Spirit, dwells within us. And he's reminding Timothy of that. And what sort of a spirit has he given them? A spirit of power. Of power. So as we go out, as we share the gospel, 
we have to remind ourselves we're not on our own. God has given us his power. He has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and self-control. That's what he's given us. And that's why I would try to encourage each one of us, take our eyes off the problems, take, us, take our eyes off what we see in people's lives. They're cold. They don't want to listen. We can have all those excuses, but to put our eyes on God's words here. He has given us a spirit of power, a spirit of love, and a spirit of self-control. And then he says in verse 8, I will end with this, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, i.e., of his life, his death, and his resurrection, nor of me, his servant, but share in the suffering of the gospel. Why? Because of his spirit who dwells in us. May God richly bless you. in our lives up to this point but we and others we know continually need God's grace so we're going to uh, pray for uh, Derek and Jane and we're also going to pray for the congregation of Dundalk whose minister is the Reverend Jonathan Porter so let's come before God's throne of grace with our prayer of intercession Almighty God we praise you for how you're enabling Derek and Jane to serve you and your church in northern Spain. We bless you for the new members you have raised up to join the team there. Provide for them as they seek to raise funds ahead of coming to Spain and guide them as they prepare to minister there. It's so encouraging to hear that one of the main things the team will focus on is church planting. So give wisdom with regards to where, how and when to plant churches. Thank you for people like Veronica, who are faithful to your word and diligent in the work of translating books and booklets into Spanish and Basque. We also praise you for leading every home crusade to, to print these resources uh, for them. Bless their distribution throughout Spain and South America. Prompt people to read them and speak by your spirit through them to draw people to saving faith in Jesus. Enable Derek and Jane to find the right balance between the time they spend in their work for you and the time they spend with their family. Undertake for Gabriella and Luca at school. Enable them to stand up for you in that context and not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Loving Father, we bring all the children, young people, and teachers connected to our congregations before you in this busy term. Motivate those young people who are doing GCSEs, ASs, A-levels, college or university exams to work to their full potential so that they do their best. Grant diligence, enthusiasm, and patience to teachers and lecturers as they seek to prepare students to sit these important exams. Enable students, teachers, lecturers, and parents to remember that knowing Jesus as our Lord and Savior is greater than any educational achievement. God of grace, thank you for your word. We pray it will dwell richly in the hearts of the people who are connected to Dundalk congregation and that your spirit will use it to enable them to grow and be fruitful. Raise up more people to serve you in the musical team, which helps to lead the praise. Bless the Reverend Jonathan Porter as he prepares and preaches your word. Also guide him in the Kirk session as they care for and lead the congregation. 
Sovereign Lord, we praise you for answering our prayers for a spell of dry weather to enable the farming and horticultural communities to prepare for this year's harvest. Provide everyone in this sector with the resilience and grace they need to deal with the financial and emotional pressures they're facing. Almighty God, we pray that you will grant those in our congregation who are your people through faith in Jesus boldness in generating and taking opportunities to speak the gospel to the people they have contact with and then guide their words. Please ensure that we do not envy wicked people or desire their company. We ask that you would place your healing hand on those we know who are ill at this time in hospital, at home, or in a care home, if this is according to your sovereign will. Grant patience to everyone who is waiting to see a medical professional or waiting for treatment. Give the medical professionals who are responsible for their care wisdom, insight, and compassion. In Jesus' strong name, we pray all these things. Amen. Our closing hymn is based on uh, some of the words from that passage we read earlier. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord or to defend his cause. Maintain the honor of his word, the glory of his cross. Let us praise God. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Amen.